Hey, welcome once again to the Journey Church, New York City. I'm Carrick, and I want to thank you for joining me today as we continue our new teaching series called God on Film, where each week we're looking for the spiritual meaning behind some of the summer's biggest movies. And today we're looking at the new film, The Perfect Find, and searching for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. So if you haven't yet, go ahead and click that button beside the live stream player, download your message notes so you can follow along during the message today. Now, because so many people in our church are single, in fact, so many people in our city are single, this is a topic, the topic we're looking at today is one that so many are already wrestling with uh, right now. And I'm often asked, you know, Carrick, what do I need to do in order to put myself in a place where I can find that special person that God has for me? Now, the good news is that the Bible has something to say about this. But so do a lot of the romantic comedies that that Hollywood is throwing out there. And they say some different things. Now, the movie we're looking at today is called The Perfect Find. And it follows the story of a young woman named Jenna who's 40 years old. And she's a journalist and she takes this new job. But when she takes this job, she didn't know that her new boss would be her frenemy. And so that makes her life complicated. But what what complicates things even more is that she falls in love with the much younger son of her boss. And so in pursuing this relationship with this much younger man, she puts her career on the line and she makes her life so much more complicated. All, all in the, the, the pursuit of discovering, is this guy the perfect find? Is he Mr. Right? You know, like Jenna discovered in, in our movie for today, dating in 2023 is hard. And searching for Mr. or Mrs. Right, it can be difficult, it can be stressful, it can be confusing. Sometimes it's even painful. And that's why today I would like to submit to you that we need God's wisdom in this pursuit. We need to invite his wisdom into our dating lives and into this pursuit. So our first verse comes from Proverbs chapter 13, verse 14. I'll put it up on the screen. It's there in your notes. I want to begin today by reading this out loud together. So wherever you're joining us for church online, I want you to read this with me, beginning with the instruction. Are you ready? Go. The instruction of the wise is like a life-giving fountain. Those who accept it avoid the snares of death. The instruction of the wise is like a life-giving fountain. Those who accept it avoid the snares of death. Here's the thing. At every stage of life, there are actions that if you take them, later on in life, when you look back, you're going to say, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did that. And at every stage of life, there are actions that if you don't take them, at the next stage of life, you're going to look back and you're going to say, Oh, I wish I had. I wish that I had. You see, there are people in your lives, parents, friends, teachers, even pastors, who gave you advice. And when they spoke into your life, at first you thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. I I don't want to do that. But now, looking back, you think to yourself, I'm so glad they told me that. Or maybe you're looking back and unfortunately thinking, I wish I had listened. I wish I had listened. And so today, there are a few things that I want to share with you from God's Word. That if you're single and you get these right, I believe later on, later on in life, you're going to look back and you're going to say to yourself, I'm so glad I listened. I'm so glad I listened. In fact, you may even point back to this day as a pivotal moment in your life. And by the way, by single, I mean those of you who have either never been married... Or, or maybe you went through a failed marriage and as, as you think about your future, you, you don't want to make the same mistakes uh, going forward that you made in the past. I also mean those of you who are single and you look at married problems. And as single, you, you look at married problems and you, you think married problems seem to be a lot worse than single problems. And so you aren't even thinking about getting married now. But listen, you never know what the future holds for you. So this is important for you. And listen, if you are married, stay with me. Because today's principles, these five godly decisions that I'm I'm going to challenge you to make, while they are best activated before you get married, they're just as important in your marriage. So this is going to strengthen your marriage as well. Now, the truth is the Bible doesn't emphasize finding the right person. Like in our movie, uh, uh, The Perfect Find, and and in other rom-coms, the Bible doesn't emphasize finding the right person as much as it emphasizes becoming the right person. See, our culture says, 
find the right one. But you know what God says? God says, no, you be the right one. You be the right one. And that's the key to finding Mr. or Mrs. Right. And so today, I want to look at five decisions directly from Scripture to help you in your search for Mr. or Mrs. Right by helping you become the kind of person that you're looking for. So here's the first decision. You're, you're looking for Mr. or Mrs. Right. Here's the first uh, biblical decision. Write this in. Know what I'm looking for. Write that in. Know what I'm looking for. Now, as we get started, I want to be clear here. I'm not talking about the externals. You know, I know what I'm looking for in, in what someone looks like, their looks, their profession, their salary, their status. Uh, those are external factors. And I'm not talking about looking for those things in, in a person. When I say know what you're looking for, I'm talking about the internals. What's on the inside? What are the spiritual characteristics of the person that you want to date? Are they honest? Are they compassionate? Are they patient? Are they loving? Do they treat people with respect? Do they have integrity? Most importantly, do they love God? Are they, are they striving to follow Jesus? You see, it's important to set godly standards when it comes to searching for Mr. or Mrs. Right. Listen, if you let your guard down with this first decision, what's going to happen is you're going to end up settling for someone who you really shouldn't have been dating in the first place. You may find yourself, for, uh, you may find yourself falling for someone who's completely wrong for you, Mr. or Mrs. Wrong. And so in order to avoid Mr. or Mrs. Wrong, ask yourself these two questions even before you consider dating someone. In fact, I want you to write these two questions down in your notes. I left you a little space there. Here's question number uh, one. Is this a person of faith? Before you even go out on a date, ask that question. Is this a person of faith? The Bible warns about marrying someone who isn't a follower of Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? Now listen, I, I know this is a difficult truth to digest. I mean, it's hard to control who you're attracted to. But let me tell you, if you don't have spiritual standards for who you're going to date... You're going, to begin, you're going to begin to date an unbeliever. Then you're going to fall for an unbeliever. And, and once, you're, once you're in that dating relationship, you're likely to fall in love with them. And once you fall in love with someone, uh, this is what I've discovered, no one can tell you anything because you're not listening anymore because you're in love. And it's hard because if you want to follow Jesus and you want your children to follow Jesus and you want to have a marriage where you, and a family where you pray together and you go to church together, but then you marry someone who doesn't have that as their goal, it's going to be a constant battle over priorities in your marriage. And your marriage, instead of pulling you closer and closer to God, is going to pull you further and further away from God. It's just hard. You know, God loves everyone, and He wants those who don't know Him to come to follow Jesus. And maybe He uses you and friendships that you have in your life in order to pull others closer to Him. But let me tell you something. Missionary dating doesn't work. You know what I'm talking about, where you're a Christian and you date someone who's not a Christian in the hopes of winning them over to Jesus. More often than not, that person ends up pulling you further from God instead of you pulling them toward God. So the first question you ask is, is this a person of faith? Here's the second question you ask before you date someone. Is this a person of integrity? Is this a person of integrity? Does this person you want to date have integrity? Are they faithful? Are they honest? Do, do they reflect Jesus in their words and in their actions? Now, someone may say that they're a Christian, but if they're constantly bending the truth, if they're tearing you down, if you watch them and they treat other people poorly, you need to ask yourself this question. What am I getting into? The point is, before you even begin dating, know what you're looking for. Don't settle, don't compromise your values because of your insecurity or your fear. Now, this brings us to the second decision to make. So the first decision is, listen, if I want to find Mr. or Mrs. Wright, I've got to define who Mr. or Mrs. Wright is. I've got to set those standards. Here's the second question, uh, the second decision. Deal with my issues. Deal with my issues. Carrick, what do you mean by my issues? You know what I mean? I mean the rough edges on your personality. See, we, we all have them, don't we? Maybe you get angry easily. You, you're constantly losing your temper. Maybe you're impatient. Maybe you complain about everything and you're constantly negative. Look, right now, if you're single, 
you're able to hide most of your issues. You know, you're, you're, you're able to avoid facing maybe a lot of the issues that you have in your life for the most part. Because what happens? If a roommate pushes your button, what do you do? Right? You, you get a new roommate. If, if your boss ticks you off, what do you do? Well, you get a new job. You know you should do something about the sin in your life, but because you're single, you can hide it more easily. And you're able to dance around your flaws, your insecurities, and your sins because you're not sharing your life with someone right now. But let me tell you, at some point, you're going to meet the love of your life, and you're going to get married. And I'm telling you, if you don't deal with your issues now, you're going to have to deal with them in a bigger and more painful way later on in your marriage. You're going to hurt your spouse because you didn't deal with your issues before you got married. Let me tell you, when your issues come out in your marriage, do you know what you're going to do? When your issues come out in your marriage, you are going to blame your spouse for them. And it's not their fault. Listen, if you're single, now is the time to work on the issues that are in your life that were caused by your past. Others may have hurt you, but it's your responsibility to deal with your reactions and to, to find a way to get better so that you don't hurt others. Let me tell you this. If you want to be happy later, now is the time to work on yourself. Not later. Look at what Hebrews 12 one says there in your notes. It says, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily hinders our progress. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Let me tell you this. If you deal with your issues now, if you deal with your sin now, if you deal with your personality flaws now, you will be so glad that you did later on. What are the issues? What are the rough edges that you need to work on? You know, apply biblical principles to your life daily. You know, come to terms and forgive that person who hurt you. You know, ask for forgiveness if you need it. Ask for help in dealing with these issues. Ask someone in your growth group to be an accountability partner with you. Find a Christian counselor if there are emotional issues you need to work through. But refuse to go to the next stage in your life, to the next stage in your relationships, until you deal with your issues. Now, back in your notes. Here's the third decision to searching for Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Know what I'm looking for, deal with my issues. And then number three, get out of debt. Get out out of debt. Here's what I mean. If you're in debt, get out of debt. If you're not in debt, stay out of debt. Look at what uh, the Bible has to say about debt in Psalm 37, 21. It says, the wicked borrow and never repay, but the godly are generous givers. You know what I'm talking about? Buying things you don't need with money you don't have in a way that makes you, uh, that puts you in debt and makes you a slave to someone else. Now listen, maybe, um, Maybe you, you've spent more money than you had. Or maybe you have student loan debt and you've had your student loan debt so long that it feels like an extra partner that you're carrying with you all the way through life. You're just dragging them around from uh, stage to stage in life. And so listen, if you're single, now is the best time for you to get out of debt. Now is the best time for you to learn how to manage your finances in a way that, that honors God. And here's why. It will never be easier for you to get out of debt than it is right now. I know sometimes people think, well, it's going to be easier to get out of debt when, when I get married. My spouse is going to have a bigger income. But let me tell you, it's so much easier to get out of debt while you're still single than after you're married and then you have responsibilities and then kids come along. Ask any married person and they'll tell you they wish they, they, wish they would have gotten out of debt before they got married. And then secondly, let me just make a point. We're talking about searching for Mr. and Mrs. Wright. Your debt makes you less attractive. <laughs> That's sort of blunt to say, but your debt makes you less attractive. You know, you're really cute now, but when he finds out you've got $15,000 in, in credit card debt, he, he's, he's going to think, she was really attractive until I found out about that debt, and now, now her eyebrows aren't exactly even uh, w when it comes to that. You know, or guys, she thinks you might be the one until she finds out you can't pay your student loans every month. And she's thinking to herself, is this really what I want to get into? Is, 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 is this the guy that I, I want to be with? Is this what life would be like with this person? But the big problem is your poor financial habits will become someone else's financial problem in the future. I'm telling you, if you drag around your debt long enough, you're going to meet someone and you're going to have to introduce your debt into that relationship. And let me tell you, it's an awkward conversation. 
Yes, I, I know we've been dating, but I want to introduce you to my two friends here, Mr. MasterCard and Ms. Student Loan Debt. Yeah, they come with me. You know, I hate to tell you, there are going to be four people in this relationship, all four of us, you, me, and all of my, all of my debt. Now, is that a conversation that you want to have? No, that's not a conversation that you want to have to have. And so you need to decide that you're going to deal with it, that you're going to get out of debt now. Deal with it now while it's a single problem. Let me tell you, married problems are a whole lot harder to deal with than single problems. I mean, married fights over money are epic. The very first fight my wife Lori and I had after we got married was over money. And uh, it lasted for like six months. We, we really got into it uh, because we hadn't dealt with our issues before the marriage. But there is an even better reason for you to get out of debt. Being single, you have freedom that married couples, especially married couples with kids, don't have. You know what you can do? You can go on a mission trip. Uh, you can go on a mission trip to South Africa without asking anybody. You want to leave your job and go to work for a nonprofit? Go for it. You, you want to start a new business venture? Go for it. You can leverage your freedom to do those things. But so often I'll hear about a great person in our church. And they, they really want to go to South Africa and work with those kids at, at Hope Schools, but they can't. You know why they can't? Because they're carrying around so much debt. They don't have any money to do that with. I've talked to a lot of people who want to give. They want to honor God by being a tither. And, and the reason they say they can't is because of the debt they're carrying around. Let me tell you, don't let debt... Get in the way of God's plans for your life. Make the decision. You're going to get your financial life in order now. And look, you're smart. I mean, you can figure this out. I mean, get a cheaper apartment. Cut up your credit cards. Get on a budget. You know, the only debt you should have in your life is the debt of love that you owe to others. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 13, verse 8. Read this one out loud with me. Beginning with owe nothing. Are you ready? Go. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love them. So, in your pursuit to find Mr. and Mrs. Wright, know what you're looking for, deal with your issues, get out of debt, and then fourthly, here's the fourth decision of finding Mr. and Mrs. Wright. Stay out of bed. Stay out of bed. Yeah, that's right. You know exactly what I'm talking about here. You know, sometimes we talk about this, this issue and, and we think, Carrick, look, I know what the Bible says about sex, but that, listen, that was 2,000 years ago. The, the world has changed. They didn't understand our highly sexualized culture. But, uh, yeah, they really did. Because you see in the New Testament, Paul wrote letters to highly sexualized cities whose illicit sex cultures dwarf even what we deal with today. In Corinth, where uh, Paul helped start a church, there were legalized sex slaves. There were temple prostitutes. They made, Corinth made New York City look like a little house on the prairie when it came to what they were doing sexually. And so if your first thought is, oh, well, they didn't understand our culture today, you would be dead wrong. Trust me, in the Roman Empire, they did. And so when Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth, and he was talking about this, it was in the midst of rampant sexual activity. And I want you to understand, when Paul wrote this letter, he didn't just say, hey, don't do it, stop doing it. He gives some incredible insight as to why purity is important. Now, I want you to look at this next passage. It's in, in, the, uh, in your notes. I'll put it up on the screen. It's 1 Corinthians 6, and beginning with verse 18. Let's take a, a moment to look at what Paul says here. He begins by saying this, Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Now hold your finger here for just, just a moment. I want you to understand, Paul isn't saying that sexual sin is worse than other kinds of sin. He's saying it's just different. It's different. And here's the thing. You already know that, don't you? For some of you, your greatest regret in your life, it's not about money. Your greatest regret is about a sexual mistake that you made in your past. And you know that there's something about abusing your sexuality or using your sexuality in an inappropriate way that hurts you. Not just physically, but it hurts you inside. It hurts you spiritually. You make a sexual mistake and you can't get it out of your mind. It's like no other category. There's something incredibly personal, emotional, and spiritual about sex. And so Paul says, with godly wisdom and with love, he says, be careful with sex because it goes far beyond just the physical. 
Now back to the scripture, 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, we, we looked at the first part, but jumping back in, Paul says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Paul says, honor, honor God with your body. He says, save sex for the marriage relationship. Now look, I know this isn't the most popular path to take. But Paul says, if you will stay out of bed, if you will honor God with your body, at the next stage of life, when you look back, you will be so glad that you did. Just as in some cases now, when you look back, you're so sorry that you didn't. Listen, maybe you're not sure how you feel about what I'm saying right now. Listen, that's okay. But maybe right now your life is sort of stuck in a rut. Maybe there's something inside of you where you're going through relationship after relationship after relationship. And there's something inside of you telling you, hey, listen, something is not right. You're not doing something right. If you'll choose to stay out of bed, if you'll choose to begin to honor God with your body, I promise you, you're going to begin to see yourself. You're going to begin to see your relationships and others and God. You're going to see everything differently. Because let me tell you, there's a clarity, a a mental and spiritual clarity that comes with moral purity. And you know this because when you're sexually active, you know what it's like? It's like living in a fog where you can't see things clearly. You can't make clear decisions. And so to put yourself in the best position to find Mr. or Mrs. Right, I hope you'll take this step. Honor God. Give it a shot and see if he doesn't bring more clear clarity and blessing to your life. So put yourself in the best position to find Mr. or Mrs. Right. Make the decision that you're going to know what you're looking for. You're going to deal with your issues. You're going to get out of debt. You're going to stay out of bed. If you do those four, you're going to be so glad that you did. I promise you. But then here's the final decision to make in your search for Mr. or Mrs. Right. Write this in. Grow in my relationship with God. Grow in my relationship with God. And here's what I mean. Decide right now that you're going to make God the primary relationship in your life. Because if you want God to bless your future or current relationship, then make sure that God is your primary relationship right now. Begin working on spiritual habits now that will grow your relationship with God and that will carry over into future relationships that you have. Listen, if you have a dream that you're going to be going to church with your family one day, start that habit now. If you dream about praying and reading the Bible with a future spouse or your future family, then start that habit now by yourself. If you want God to be at the center of your future relationship, then put Him at the center of your life now. Now is the best time to grow in your relationship with God. And here's why. Growing closer to God gives you the best chance of finding Mr. or Mrs. Right. Because, let me tell you, listen to me. Because you are becoming the Mr. or Mrs. Right that somebody else is looking for right now. Look at this promise from James chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, draw close to God and God will draw close to you. You take a step towards God and He is going to cover the rest of the distance. You know, ultimately, the key issue here, finding Mr. or Mrs. Right, it's, it's not about debt, it's not about sex, and it, is, it isn't even about your flaws. The key issue is having a Heavenly Father who loves you, who cares about you, and who wants to connect with you in a real way. And, and, and let me just say this. If you could see your life right now through God's eyes, if you could see your life through God's perspective, you would see that He wants only the very best for you. Now, you may be thinking, okay, Carrick, I, I see what you're saying today. I, I know I need to deal with my debt. And, and, and that sex thing, I think you're crazy, but I, I hear what you're saying. And okay, I, I know I have an anger issue and I lose my temper. I need, to, I need to do something about it. And you're right. I know I need to take steps with God. I need to get right with God. And so what you do is you heard me. And so you're just going to pick one or two, make one or two of these decisions and, and move forward. But let me tell you, if you're not willing to make these five decisions I've laid out for you today and get serious about them, then when you meet the potential love of your life and you begin moving forward in that relationship, you are going to become something that you hate. And that thing you're going to become is a hypocrite. And here's why. When you meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright, do you know what you're going to hope? 
You're going to hope that they've gotten out of debt. You're going to hope that they've stayed out of bed. You're going to hope that they've dealt with their issues. And you're going to hope that they've gotten right with God. That's what you're looking for, right? I mean, that's your dream. If you had the list, that's, that's, that's what you want. You want, to hear, you want to hear, yeah, I had some credit card debt, but you know what I did? I buckled down. I got disciplined, and I paid off my debt, and now I'm saving for the future. You know what? You're thinking, big check mark on that person. I, I, that's very attractive. You know, you, th- you, think, you start thinking, I always thought you were too short for me, but now you've gotten taller in, in my eyes. I can even deal with whatever's going on with your hair now because you're taking those steps. You see, why would you refuse to work on your garbage when you're going to hope the person you meet has already worked on their garbage? How about this? After college, I moved in with my girlfriend or boyfriend, but I realized that wasn't right. So I moved out, uh, and since then, I've been waiting on the, the right person for marriage. You know, check, that person just goes up a huge amount in, in, in your eyes. And then deal with your issues. I mean, you know what? No guy says, you know what? I want a girl with daddy issues. I want a girl who comes into the marriage roaring angry and blames me for everything. And, and that's just going to be that's going to be great. That's what I want to fight all the time. No guy says that. And, and, and nobody wants this. You know, I hate my mother. Well, you're the guy I'm looking for. You hate your mother. Then we can hate your mother together. Then you can hate me. That's going to be awesome. Nobody's looking for that. All I'm saying is, if these five decisions are good news for the person you want to meet one day, then decide to become that person today. Be the person that you're looking for. Let me ask you, will you trust God with finding Mr. or Mrs. Wright in your life? Will you trust God with these issues we've been talking about today? Debt, sex, personal issues, faith. Look, some of you, how you've managed your life and your relationships to this point, it hasn't been working. You know it hasn't been working. You know it's time for a change. I want to encourage you, trust God's wisdom. He created you. He loves you. He wants the best for you. Trust Him. And if you do, if you do, here's my promise. When you get to the next stage of life and you look back, you're going to be saying, I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. But if you don't, I'm afraid in the next few years, you're going to look back and you're going to say, I really wish I had. I wish I had. Look at our final verse. It's our memory verse for today. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. An important verse and one that I think you should have in your heart as we put our trust in God for finding Mr. or Mrs. Right. Let's read it together, beginning with trust. Are you ready? Go. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all you do, and He will direct your paths. Would you bow your heads with me right now? And let's go to God in prayer. Wherever you're joining us for Church Online, if you would bow your head and close your eyes, and let's go to God in prayer. God, I want to pray right now for every person in our church who is searching for a godly relationship. I pray that you give them the wisdom and the strength they need to make these five godly decisions we've been looking at today. And God, I pray that if it is your will, you will bring that perfect man or that perfect woman into their life. God, we trust your timing. And listen, as we pray, if you've never gotten right with God by putting your trust in Jesus, I want to invite you to do that today. Let me tell you, the most important relationship you will ever have in your life is your relationship with the God that that can give you the best life now and the God who can give you eternal life forever in heaven. And if you're ready to ask Jesus into your life, you can simply pray this prayer with me silently in your heart and believe it in your heart as I pray it out loud. Pray this with me. Father, I am a sinner and I need you. And so today for the first time, I confess that I believe in Jesus. He died for my sins and I believe that on the cross and he rose again. And today, God, I commit to follow Jesus as my leader and Lord for the rest of my life. I trust you. Come into my life and forgive me and save me and secure my eternity in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.